Tyquan Cox, a.k.a. Little Fee, was born on December 1st, 1965. And from the very beginning, Little Fee was groomed to be set on a path for destruction. It's said that his mom was a prostitute and a drug addict, and that his father, he never really had much of a relationship with him at all. Little Fee's grandmother did try to step in and stir him in the right direction, getting him into things like Boy Scouts, Little League football, things of that nature. And actually, when he played Little League football, he played under the, the guidance of an NFL player by the name of Kermit Alexander. And uh, Kermit Alexander was interviewed and he said that he remembered Little Fee as a kid because he was a standout talent. You know, Little Fee was very talented at football, but he also said he remembered him being a very angry young man and he didn't get along with the other kids. And that he almost had the thought to take Little Fee to the side, you know, and maybe mentor him or something. But he just didn't do it. But their paths would cross later on in life. See, Little Fee not only came from a volatile background, he was growing up in a volatile environment in inner city Los Angeles in the 1980s when the power of the Bloods and the Crips was on the rise and the violence was also on the rise. Too many people are getting killed. It. The white man tried to make money off of it. You see they record? Welcome to 63rd Street, home turf of the Rolling 60s, part of the largest street gang in all of Los Angeles. Now what do you do? What do you do that makes people so fearful? <laughs> we can walk into a place and that'll make people fearful just knowing that it's name. Rolling 60s. The name. And what it carries behind it. Like uh, what does it carry behind it? It carries dirt, carries murder, carries whatever you want. At the age of 12 years old, Little Fee was evaluated by a child psychologist. It said that 15 different events had occurred in his life where he could be diagnosed with PTSD. Could you imagine that? PTSD at 12 years old. And that terror that Little Fee experienced in life, he put that terror on the city of Los Angeles through assault, through robbery, shootings, murder little fee couldn't resist the streets even though his grandmother tried to keep him on a straight and narrow along with teachers at his school who said that little fee was actually a good student but the gang just got a hold of him and that grip couldn't be broken and little fee ended up joining the rolling 60s crips he didn't just join he became a feared member it's a legendary gangster out of Los Angeles by the name of Monster Cody, rest in peace. But he was doing an interview on his run-ins with Little Fee, like jailhouse fights, shootings, things like that. And he said one time him and his friend was at a burger spot and they saw Little Fee and a group of Rolling 60s Crips coming their way. And he said his friend wanted to get up out of there, but Monster said he wasn't gonna run. So what he did was stepped outside, yelled out gangster, and start shooting at the rolling 60s. He said they all started running. Everybody except for Little Fee. He said he stood right there and started blasting back at him. And he said that's when all the rest of the rolling 60s seen him and you know they joined in and he said he had to retreat. He described Little Fee as like reptilian. He said his eyes would change colors when he got mad. He described him as a shapeshifter, evil. And evil is the only word that could describe the events that occurred on August 31st, 1984, when Darren Williams and Horace Burns showed up to the door of a woman by the name of Ida Moore, and she was accompanied by a woman named Lisa Brown. Darren Williams told the woman that he needed a ride. 
and along the way on this ride, they picked up Little Fee. He instructed the woman to take him to 59th Street. He had an address that he was looking for. So they began to creep until they found the spot. He instructed Ida Moore to park down the block. She did. From there, Darren Williams got out of the vehicle, placed a pistol in the small of his back. Little Fee, he got out of the vehicle as well with a gun wrapped in the jacket. They entered the home and almost immediately, gunfire erupted. About two minutes later, Darren Williams came back to the vehicle. About a minute after that, Little Fee returned. Once inside the vehicle, Little Fee said, I just blew that bitch's head off, so drive. From there, the cops arrived on the scene, tried to put together exactly what could have occurred that would cause an innocent family to be murdered in such a horrific way. The five people who were in that van all went their separate ways until later that night when Darren Williams once again contacted Ida Moore and said that he needed another ride. She picked him up and along the way they picked up Little Fee again and they headed to a spot called the Vermont Club. According to the women, once the men left from inside of that Vermont club, they had a large sum of cash with them. And it said that Little Fee had the 30 caliber rifle that he had earlier that morning as well. And he had it wrapped in a jacket still. Little Fee instructed the woman to take him over to 10th Street, where he went to an apartment. In that apartment was a man by the name of James Kennedy, his friend. He asked James Kennedy to get rid of the gun and to wash the jacket. He washed the jacket, but he ain't get rid of that gun. He wanted to keep it, so he did. But this would later cause everything to fall apart. From there, Little Fee went out, copped a Cadillac for $3,000. Darren Williams went out, put a down payment for his wife's vehicle. He would later say that during this time, he had formed a half ounce a day crack habit and that him and Little Fee spent the night before the murders on a drug binge. About a month later, police would close in on Little Fee and the crew because they arrested James Kennedy, the man who Little Fee had went to to dispose of the weapon and the jacket that he had used in the murders. James Kennedy was arrested because he was under investigation for narcotics. But once he was arrested, he decided to give Little Fee up and tell the police what he knew. He gave him the murder weapon. And once police was able to match the ballistics from the murders, with the bullets from the weapon, it was all but over for Little Fee. And not too long after that, everybody who was involved was arrested. And the police was closing in on exactly why this tragedy happened. The community was saying that it could have been over a drug debt, but a lot of people were saying it was murder for hire. Murder for hire because in 1983, a female had a birthday party at the Vermont Club. And at this birthday party, she was shot and paralyzed. And she ended up suing the Vermont Club for $2 million because her being paralyzed, she was gonna to need to be taken care of for the rest of her life. So she sued the club and people were saying that the club owner, a man by the name of Aussie Jackson, AKA Diamond Jack, put a $60,000 hit out on this woman and gave the address to Darren Williams. But see, it was only one problem with this address. It was the wrong one. It was to the home of the family of NFL player, Kermit Alexander. The same Kermit Alexander who coached Little Fee when he was an angry young boy. But see, remember when I said their paths would cross again in life? This is how they crossed under these extremely tragic circumstances. And that same angry young boy that he seen became an angry young man and it took the lives of his family members. 
Los Angeles police say the mother, sister, and two nephews of former National Football League star Kermit Alexander were shot dead in their home today. Witnesses said that two gunmen walked in the family bungalow and opened fire. They didn't say anything, said a 13-year-old boy who escaped by hiding in a closet. He said they just came in shooting. Alexander was a star halfback at UCLA, then played for San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Philadelphia in an 11-year professional career. During the trial of Little Fee, all of the gruesome details would come out on exactly how these murders went down. It said that Darren Williams and Little Fee entered the home where 59-year-old Abora Alexander was having a cup of coffee. Little Fee took his rifle and shot her in the head. From there, they entered a room where 25-year-old Dietra Alexander, 6-year-old Damon Bonner, and 12-year-old Damani Gardner-Alexander were all in. The boys were asleep. Dietra Alexander was just sitting up on the bed. The two men entered the room and shot Dietra three times, in the head and in the neck. Then they murdered the two young boys. The boy's 14-year-old son, Neil Alexander, was awoke by all of the gunfire and seen one of the gunmen standing over Dietra. He jumped on his back and tried to fight him. And you know, they fell over a trunk, but the gunman regained control of the gun and hit Neil in the face. He ran out of the house. It was also Abora's grandson at the home who hid in the closet and the gunman never found him. Little Fee and Darren Williams fled the scene with Horace Burns acting as lookout and the two women, Ida Moore and Lisa Brown, acting as the getaway drivers. But the women were never convicted in these crimes. They decided to testify against the other three men. Horace Burns was convicted and sentenced to life in prison, even though he decided to also testify against Little Fee. But in return for his testimony, he didn't get the death penalty. Darren Williams was convicted and he did receive the death penalty. It was later reduced to life in prison. Little Fee, he received the death penalty as well, and it was pretty easy for the jury to do it, even though they tried to have character witnesses come out, like his grandmother, his younger brother and sister, and people like that, to try to maybe sway the jury to see another side of Little Fee. But I think the only side they seen of him was of a cold-blooded killer. But even after being locked up, Little Fee stayed active. In 1988, he stabbed legendary Crip founder Tookie Williams over a dispute because Tookie wanted Little Fee to kill his co-defendant, Darren Williams, because he felt like he was an informant. And once Little Fee refused to do this, it started a war amongst the Crips that were on death row, resulting in Little Fee stabbing Tookie. Then in 1998, Little Fee was attacked by a group of bloods and the next day as he was walking by one of their cells he stabbed him through the cell bars with a spear that he had made and then finally in the year 2000 little fee made a brazen escape from san quentin prison where him and two other inmates paul tuliapa aka roscoe and noel no no jackson took a guard hostage then they tried to take over a guard shack Eventually, they failed at their attempt. Later, when uh, the inmates were interviewed, Paul Tuliapa said their goal really wasn't to escape. It was to try to kill as many guards as they possibly could. After this, Little Fee was placed in a hole. And as a protest, he decided he wanted to get rid of all his worldly items, meaning TVs, newspapers, uh, beds, anything that had anything to do with the outside world. He got rid of it and he slept in a cell made of nothing but concrete for many, many years, according to guards. And they said he would work out all the time and his lights would be on, on this, in this cell all the time, just to give you kind of like an insight on what type of dude he really was. And one of the co-defendants, when they were being interviewed about these murders, Horace Burns, he said, Little Fee, he don't think at all. And Little Fee was quoted as saying that he learned to block out certain things so he could do what he needed to do. I'm assuming that meant murder. And to this day, Little Fee is still on death row. He's about 55 years old and 
actually uh, Kermit Alexander ended up suing the state of California because they still haven't executed him. And he is a huge proponent of the death penalty. He actually has been fighting in the state of California to keep the death penalty around when they were trying to make laws to possibly get rid of it. So, you know, it's definitely tragic and traumatic for him. But there is a little bit of silver lining in this story. Um, he lost four family members and he ended up adopting four Haitian children, you know, and he raised them up and they have a beautiful family. He also released a memoir in 2015 about the events that happened in his life, you know, and especially the tragic events that happened to his mom and to his family. And I just want to say rest in peace to the four innocent people who lost their lives on that day.